So what we'll do is take a look at uh, Mark chapter 10. I encourage you to turn in your pew Bibles to page 44 and just look at it. It's a short little passage. But sometimes when you're looking at it and hearing it, things jump out. So take a look at Mark chapter 10. I'll begin in verse 46. Listen now to the word of God. They came to Jericho as he and his disciples and a large crowd were leaving Jericho. Bartimaeus, son of Timaeus, a blind beggar, was sitting by the roadside. And when Bartimaeus heard that it was Jesus of Nazareth, he began to shout out and say, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. Many sternly ordered him to be quiet. But he cried out even more loudly, Son of David, have mercy on me. Jesus stood still and said, Call him here. And they called the blind man, saying to him, Take heart. Get up. He's calling you. So throwing off his cloak, he sprang up and came to Jesus. Then Jesus said to him, what do you want me to do for you? The blind man said to Jesus, My teacher, let me see again. Jesus said to him, Go, your faith has made you well. Immediately he regained his sight and followed Jesus on the way. This is the word of the Lord. Let's pray together. Lord, we thank you on this day of when the church celebrates its birth, Pentecost. We thank you for your spirit. And we need you, by the power of your spirit, to open our minds, open our hearts, render us teachable, not just for our own sake, but for the sake of our neighbors. Help us to be blessed, to be a blessing. And may the words of my mouth, the meditations of our hearts be acceptable in thy sight, our rock, our redeemer. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Face in the crowd. So when we watch, those of us who do UK football games, and the game is televised. Most of what we see in a UK football game, we see the game, we see the players, we see what's going on on the field. That's what the camera's showing us most of the time. But you and I both know that when we're watching a UK football game, there are times when the camera turns to the crowd and we see all the people in the crowd and my favorite parts are when it's the student section right and the students are looking into the camera and they're whooping it up and whoa whoa and making faces and just trying to be more than a face in the crowd because they know they're probably someone, one of their friends is watching the game, and now they're on TV. They want the attention of those who are watching, right? And so it was with this man, this son of Timaeus. Bar means son. Bar Timaeus, the son of Timaeus, who was blind. He wanted the attention of Jesus. He didn't want to be just a face in the crowd. So let's take a look. What, what's happening is it's the time of Passover. This is late in the ministry of Jesus. This will be his last time to Jerusalem, and it's Passover in Jerusalem. Today's scene takes place in Jericho. Jericho is about 14 miles. It takes nine hours to walk on a Roman road up and through the wilderness, through mountain peaks and valleys to get to Jerusalem. 
And so you've got in the vicinity of Jericho, of the city, you've got this man sitting there, a beggar who's blind by the side of the road. And when it's the Passover, there's a steady stream of pilgrims, of people, not pilgrims like, you know, Mayflower pilgrims, but I mean pilgrims that are going on a pilgrimage to the Passover in Jerusalem. They're going up the road, and it's thousands of people coming on this road through Jericho, but they're not coming in big masses, you know, like an amoeba, like they were with Jesus. They were going in a, more of a steady stream. But there's Bartimaeus, who had not been blind from birth. He'd had sight, but he, in spoiler alert, he regains his sight, but he, he had lost it. But he's by the side of the road, he's begging, and he hears this this hubbub, you know, this, you know, sound of this crowd coming on the road. And what is this? You know, Jesus was a celebrity by this point, of course. It, he had a mass of people around him, his disciples. It was like bumper to bumper, bumper people. And they're all going to Passover. And he hears this. He finds out that it's Jesus. He obviously knew something about Jesus. Obviously knew something about Jesus because of what he said here, right? And so he starts calling out, and he starts making a scene, trying to not just be a face in the crowd, but to get Jesus' attention. And he's calling out, and he's being loud, and how do the people around him respond? Shut up, just shut up, you know? Give us all a break. You know, he's making quite a scene. And how does he respond? He just gets louder. He just, he's determined. He's, he's going to try to get Jesus' attention. And he shouts more and more repeatedly. And what does he say? It's what Bartimaeus says that's quite compelling and that surely in part draws the attention of Jesus in addition to the volume and the repetition. It's what Bartimaeus says. Bartimaeus says, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. Well, this is a power-packed statement. This is a faith-filled statement on the part of Bartimaeus. Bartimaeus is referring to Jesus as the Messiah. Jesus, Messiah. When he says son of David, that's another way of saying Messiah. Why? Because God made a covenant with King David when King David was alive, and God said to King David, I am going to make your throne last forever. And then when the prophets, Jeremiah and Ezekiel and other prophets came along, Isaiah, they referred to this kingdom of God that was coming and that the king of this kingdom of God that was coming would be in the line of David, a new David, a son of David, the Messiah. The prophet Micah says that this son of David, Messiah, would be born in the city of David, Bethlehem. There's a genealogy at the beginning of the Gospel of Matthew, and it's a genealogy going through King David all the way up to Joseph. And then, spoiler alert, there's no Joseph blood technically in Jesus. But nonetheless, in the line of David, son of David, Jesus, Bartimaeus says, Messiah, son of David. And then he says, have mercy on me. Have mercy on me. Have mercy on me. Now, mercy is a commodity that is given by God. This is something that the Messiah dispenses, mercy. God has the power to give mercy. God has the authority to give mercy. So what is mercy? 
Mercy is that which is given by God that helps to alleviate the pain that comes from suffering due to sin. Did you get that? Mercy is that which is given by God to help alleviate the pain that comes from suffering due to sin. Sin? Well, how do we suffer because of sin? Well, we might need mercy because of our own sin. Maybe we've shot ourselves in the foot and we've blown it and we've done all kinds of terrible stuff. And finally, you know, we have a come to Jesus moment. We're like, have mercy. I'm so sorry. I've made a mess of it. Our own sin. We need mercy because now we're suffering. Maybe the suffering is because of someone else having committed sin and we're caught in the crossfire or a loved one is caught in the crossfire. Someone else's sin that somehow causes us to suffer. And so we need mercy because of their sin. And then in the case of, I'm guessing, with Bartimaeus, I don't think he sinned. I don't think someone sinned against him so that he was blind. It seems to me that he had some kind of a problem that's just what happens in life. It's a fallen world, right? There's disease, there's death, there's sickness, there's natural disasters, there's craziness in nature, you know, lions will get us if we walk out there and say, oh, I'm brave. I mean, it's just so much could happen that's not someone else's sin or my sin where we suffer that we need mercy. Sin that came into the world through the first people and caused all creation to fall. And then here we are suffering from the consequences of fallen creation. Any one of those reasons why we suffer, we all need mercy. This guy needed mercy, couldn't see. And so he's saying, Jesus, Messiah, have mercy on me. Jesus stops this big crowd stops and Jesus summons Bartimaeus to come and when Bartimaeus is told he's calling for you did you see did you hear Bartimaeus's response what did he do he threw aside his cloak he jumped to his feet and he went he obviously didn't have a problem with his ankles you know he had a problem with his eyes but not his ankles he jumped and he got there to Jesus did you see what Jesus said to him? Did that strike you as kind of conspicuous? Here's this blind guy. Is brought to Jesus. Praise God, he's not just a face in the crowd. Now he's getting his audience with Jesus. And what does Jesus say, do? What does Jesus say? What can I do for you? Isn't it obvious as a heart attack? In Jesus the Messiah, God in the flesh, doesn't he know this guy's blind? Doesn't he know that this guy needs to be able to see again? And if Jesus knows that this guy's blind, why didn't he just, you know, do a magic push, you know, Holy Spirit kind of thing and just heal him? And just spare him even getting up. He has the man come forward, faces him, and then Jesus, for everybody to hear, says, and everybody else is like, Jesus, surely you know. And he says, what can I do for you? Why would Jesus do that? Knowing. When Jesus is giving the Sermon on the Mount early in his ministry in Matthew... Jesus is instructing people to, when they pray, pray the Lord's Prayer. Pray for needs. Pray for your daily bread. Pray that your debts would be forgiven. Pray that you would be delivered from evil. All things that people need. Jesus says, pray these things. And at the same time, before Jesus gives them the Lord's Prayer, he says, 
Your Father in heaven knows what you need before you even pray it. Pray it anyway. Say it anyway. He knows what you need, but say it. If he's father, it's a personal thing. It's a dialogical thing, dialogue. It's a relate to God thing. So this man, Bartimaeus, comes up to Jesus and, and uh, Jesus says, what can I do for you? He says, I'd like to have my sight back. Great, it's personal. He's expressing exactly what he needs. And what does Jesus say? Your faith, faith has made you well. Your faith has made you well. Do you know what the actual word for made you well is? Saved. Jesus says, your faith has saved you. So it's not just that this, I mean, this man believed Jesus was the Messiah. He believed that he had the authority and the power to dispense mercy and alleviate some of this suffering, right? And he expressed personally, here's exactly what I need, Jesus. And all in that is his face, this Bartimaeus' faith. And Jesus said, not, didn't just say, it's not that this faith made you able to see. He said, your faith has saved you. Now, that'll preach, and I'm not going to go off on that serious rabbit trail, but then Jesus doesn't hear either. He's got to get to the Passover. He doesn't expound on, oh, I just said saved and not made well, uh, you know, but he does that in other places. So the bottom line is, this is a serious face, and what happens? He can see. He gets his sight back. Praise the Lord. He gets his sight back. And then Bartimaeus goes on the road up to the Passover. How about that? He goes too. He doesn't just sit there. Not just a face in the crowd. You know, Jesus has all kinds of lovely and very personal encounters with individuals. Right? I mean, not too long after that, this... There's a little tax collector, a wee little man named Zacchaeus. Zacchaeus? My kids used to sing a story, Zacchaeus was a wee little man. Did, did you sing it? Did, 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 Miss Pat, did you teach that in the Sunday school? Zacchaeus was a wee little man, a wee little hot man was he. He climbed up in a sycamore tree, whatever. You know, it's that. Zacchaeus! He wasn't just a face in the crowd. Jesus saw him up there, and you know what he said to Zacchaeus? I'm coming to your house for dinner. Talk about personal. There was that woman with the flow of blood. And there was a mass of people around Jesus trying to get healed. And this woman just tried to get through all those faces in the crowd just to get to Jesus, just to grab hold of the hem of the garment so that she could be healed. She does it. Power goes out of him. She gets healed. Jesus turns around. And in front of everybody, kind of like Bartimaeus, there's an exchange between the two. Jesus cares. Jesus cares. These aren't just faces in the crowd. These are people he absolutely loves. He has compassion on them. He loves them, particularly, personally. Jesus. That's his nature. Everybody is precious in his sight, not just children. Did you see this in your bulletin, what I wrote at the top of the page? It's in the Old Testament. It's from David. This is how precious Jesus is and how precious he sees us as being. Through the power of the Holy Spirit, this is what God said through King David. For you created my inmost parts. You wove me in my mother's womb. I will give thanks to you because I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Wonderful are your works and my soul knows it very well. 
God made us together in our mother's womb. This isn't a passive, oh, it's just science kind of project. Just what happens? This is intentionality inside the womb. God is knitting together, putting together the inward parts of every human being. God's got a dog in that fight, if you will, and God intends that person to live, that person to have the opportunity in this life to know him face-to-face -face personally. David goes on to say, I am fearfully made that my person, that this process inside the womb ought to inspire fear, ought to inspire awe, reverence, and wonder. This is an awesome thing God loves from the very beginning. In the very beginning of when we're made, us, personally, intentionally. And then in the psalm it'll say, he knows the very number of hairs on my head. He knows everything about me. This is how personal God is. And Jesus loves all these people. They're not just a face in the crowd. So what about us? There were about five sermons in the message that I had today. I realized that. I realized that. But I think one of the practical takeaways is, look, we live in this life. We're going to suffer. Something's going to happen. We're going to suffer. It might be a physical something or other. It might be a health crisis. Something. We're suffering. Our body suffers. You know, we have issues. You know, something happens. We suffer. Well, I think this is for us. Call out. Help. Have mercy. God, this isn't a pray for other people, take care of other people sermon, be other oriented sermon. This is a put your mask on first before you help the child next to you sermon. Or you can't help the child next to you. You can't be a good steward of all that God's given you unless you take care of business with you. And I say that for me. Help. I'm suffering here. I've done this terrible thing. I've gotten myself in a mess. I'm sorry. Please forgive me. Have mercy. Someone else has done this horrible thing to me, to my kid, you know, driving a car, just whatever. Have mercy on me, me. That's not to say we don't pray for other people. We do, and there's plenty of sermons about that. That's not this sermon. This sermon is put the mask on first. Call out. Ask for mercy. Regardless of who did the sin or if it's just the fallen world, we're getting it. We have to. Jesus commended this man publicly for his faith for asking that he personally, me, 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 get healed. Now I'm sounding like a Baptist. I don't know. Do the Baptists preach that message? I know the Presbyterians typically don't. <laughs> they can because it's fair game. That's something we need to get in the habit of doing is praying. I love that. The example of the mask, you know, the stewardess or the steward. When you fly in a plane before it takes off and you got a kid next to you that's someone you know. And then there's an altitude change and the masks drop. The stewardess or the steward says, put your mask on first and then take care of the kid. Right? You've got to be able, in order to help other people and make a difference in other people's lives, you've got to put the mask on first. Right? So that's where this goes. You're precious. You get that. We get that. You're precious. He knows who you are. He's watching every move you make. He's listening to everything you say. He knows your thoughts before you think them. He knows what you need, but he says, ask. Ask. He's such a one. You know, he went and had dinner at uh, Zacchaeus' house. He had a little face-to-face -face with Bart. Now Bartimaeus is a star. <laughs> you know? And Bartimaeus is better than painted blue with the wig and going, Yo, I mean, he's like a great example of inspiration in the word. And so we conclude with a, an illustration. UK football. 
My daughter, Susanna, who's not pregnant, it's my daughter-in-law who's pregnant. My daughter, Susanna, went to the University of Kentucky and she was a theater major. She didn't care about sports. She didn't like sports. She sang the national anthem at the, in Rupp Arena a couple of times and, you know, that was worth the price of admission, I think, in my opinion. But she almost never went to the football games. She went to, I don't know, one or two football games. Susanna was at a football game in a season in her life when she was down, when she was just feeling distant from God, distant from people, sad, down, you know, join the club. You know, that's what I tried to tell her at the time. Join the club, sweetie. Uh, we all, but she was in a real down place and wondering, does God really care and really attend to me? And during the national anthem in Kroger Field, when everybody was, in those days, standing for the national anthem and singing, she looked out at the crowd and she saw a field of blue, blue for the fans, right? Right in the middle of that sea of blue, they were playing the University of Tennessee. What did she see? A nice dot of orange <laughs> right in the middle of the blue. Some, you know, intrepid Tennessee fan dressed in orange right in the field of blue. My daughter saw that and the Lord spoke to her and said, you're not just a face in the crowd, sweetie. <laughs> you know, I see you. I love you. I know you. She was lifted up to the extent that she wrote a little article in this or that about that very incident. I had forgotten about it, and I was just going through old journals that I keep r routinely, and I saw this story, and I thought, that'll preach. <laughs> That's how we arrive. Praise the Lord for what he did with Susanna, what he does for you, for me. He's there right for the picking. Holy Spirit, Pentecost, he's real. I hope Jesus is real to you. I hope you take him seriously. He's the meaning of life. And apart from him, we are lost. Totally. But with him, we have eternal life. And it's quite, a, quite an adventure. Right? Let's pray together. Thank you, Jesus, that you know every one of us. Thank you, Jesus, that you absolutely adore every one of us, whether we care about you or we don't. Jesus, I pray for everybody in this room, myself included, that we have a real dose of your Holy Spirit this week, maybe even today, a real dose of the reality of you in our lives. Draw us to you. Turn our heads. Help us to get rid of this ignorant, false, modest, whatever it is that holds us back from praying for ourselves. Help us to choose to pray for ourselves and obey you. Obey you and not what we think is right or what the world might think or say. Jesus, thank you that we can come to you and ask directly. But put that on our heart to know that. Change our bad, wrong thinking contrary to that so that we do exactly what you say. It's for the sake of our neighbor. Not just so that we're happy, but so that we're happy and healthy in all ways to be able to look beyond us to those who, who are also in need. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.